On Sunday nights, we're talking about the number seven, and as we were studying through the books of the kings, we came down to Naaman over in Second Kings, the fifth chapter there, where that uh, Elisha tells him to go dip seven times in the Jordan River so that he'd be clean and that that would heal him of his leprosy. Well, seven, seven has to do with, that's a complete righteous number, and then ten is a number that denotes, that's a secular righteous number. All of the old writers will say that if you multiply something by ten, that that's a form of the original number. Like if you ten to seven seventy or seven hundred or seven thousand, this is all a form of the original number. And I've brought this out to you each week because it has to do, and we're talking about revelation when we're talking about the seven. We've gone through a lot of the things about seven throughout the Bible, uh, the seven days of unleavened bread, seven times the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. God telling Israel, I'll punish you seven times for your sin. Noah sets the Ark for seven days before it, uh, before it rains, 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, you've got seven all over the Bible and in the, and in the, uh, uh, in the uh, book of Revelation, you've got seven so many times because uh, I'll read them out. I'm not going to put them on the board, but you've got seven churches, seven spirits, seven angels, seven trumpets, seven candlesticks, seven lamps, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven last plagues, seven golden vials, seven mountains, and seven kings. And all, all of these, all of these have an exact meaning. And of course, you have the seventh day, which in the Old Testament was uh, the Sabbath day of the week. But of course, Sabbath doesn't mean seventh, it means rest. And uh, every seven years, you had a sabbatical year. And every seven sets of seven years, for every, you'd have seven times seven, 49 years. On the 50th year, you had the year of Jubilee. So seven has to do with uh, completion is what it has to do with, all from one end of the Bible to the other. And I've given you this each time we stand up because I want you to understand that you have uh, the words Shabuah. Here's two words in the Old Testament. You have one has to do with seven. Uh, they both have to do with seven. S-H-A-B-U-W-A. S-H-A-B-U-W-A. This is one of the most important things about seven that you'll find. Shabua is the word week, week. And then you have the word Shabua, S-H-A-B-U-W-A-H. S-H-A-B-U-W-A-H. And that word means to take an oath. So when you're thinking of sevens, you're talking about taking an oath to God. An oath, uh, when we do an oath, it's half of a contract. When you have a contract, you have the buyer and the seller of a house. You got two X's there. We only sign one X. That's all we do. And that's taking an oath to a contract. And a contract is called a covenant or a testament. God signs the contract. And he says, now the way you will sign the contract and take an oath to me, you will, it will be circumcision. And circumcision uh, is a sign of, it's a sign of the covenant there in the 17th chapter of Genesis. And it means to cut off a removal of self or removal of sin. And of course, that has to do with taking an oath. And then... From this word Shabua, when you seven something, it takes an oath and it bows to God. How long does it take us to be circumcised of our sin? It takes our entire lifetime and we call that being sevened. And then you have the word Shaba, which comes from these words Shabua. And that word Shaba means it is actually a word that uh, has to do with seven. And it comes from the word seven, Sheba, S-H-I-B-A-H. Sheba 
That word Sheba is the word seven. It's a cardinal number. It is the word seven. And Sheba comes from Shaba, and that word Shaba means to seven oneself. Now, the fact that seven is connected with oneself, to seven oneself, that's this word Shaba. That's when you take an oath to God and you go through sevens. I said, I've brought it out so many times. God says in the 26th chapter of Leviticus, He tells Israel, I will punish you seven times for your sin. And he says that four times, and each time he mentions the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. And the beast was the way God's going to seven them. God's going to send the sword upon Israel when they go after other gods. Then he'll send famine upon them, and he is dealing with them severely, and he will send the pestilence, plague, and disease... And he calls these his four judgments. And then last of all, he will send the beast. If they're not obedient to these three, he said, I'll send the beast. And this is God sevening his people. And the beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And what's amazing, that's in the Old Testament. Uh, God would send all of these judgments... And then he'd send the Babylonian system, and it would be overthrown by the Persian system. That would be overthrown by the Grecian system, and that would be overthrown by the Roman system. And I've had people say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a hard, mean God. You don't have that same God in the New Testament. You don't. What was Rome? Was that the beast? Was that the judgment of God? When was Rome here? I think it was here ruling the world. The same judgment of God, the beast, was here during the time of Jesus for the following several hundred years, and then it became Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and it will be that till the end of time. So if you think we don't have the same God, when he killed people over here... He's got a beast that he'll cause to kill people over here. It's the same beast. If you'll notice, it's the same beast from the Old Testament because Babylon was the beast in the Old Testament that carried Israel into captivity, isn't it? So it's not only the same God, it's the same judgment. It's just that when you, when you get to uh, the New Testament... He's not sending literal sword famine pestilence. It is coming in the world, but that's not the way he's judging Israel now. He's put them under the beast, and if he has to starve you to death, he'll still use that. If he has to use pestilence, he'll still use that. So we are being sevened in this word Shabbat, which comes from Shabuah, in Shabuah. It means to seven oneself or to complete, to bring to completion... Or, or feed to the full. It means to fill up. Fill up or feed to the full. He's going to feed our lives to the full and he's going to seven us. And I've said this before. I've said it before. Think of seven. Think of seven as a, a, a descriptive word like an adjective or an adverb. Uh, Think of Jim Brown as a sevened guy because God has put him through so much, so many things, and that means that I've gone through the fiery trials. To be seven is to go through a blood baptism. Of course, uh, Peter speaks of adding to your faith, and he, and he talks about seven things. So that's what gets rid of the sin or the leprosy in our life like it did Naaman. Now, what we're doing, we're, we're going through... Since the number seven is a revelation uh, number as much as any other book in the Bible, I'm taking you to the book of Revelation, and we've gone through so many things. And, and whenever, I, whenever I go to Revelation, sometimes when I go into it, I just take off in one area. Revelation is a... Let me write this on the board. Revelation... is a seven book. That's what it is. It's a seven book. And the Bible speaks of sevens there. And he's talking about 
seven churches, which actually means a refined church. Remember we talked about last week that seven is the number of completion. It's the number of spiritual, spiritual, that's a blood baptism, that's being seven, spiritual completion, and 12 is the number of the, 12 is the number of the, uh, uh, of the total church, total church. I might mention this, I remember doing this. I remember uh, adding the figures up in Gematria. Gematria is a study. Some people try to call it superstitious. It so much adds up in it, there's no way it's that. But in the Old Testament, I might have it on... Let me look at the front of my Bible. Sometimes I'll have that. Uh, I was going to show you something to show you that this is the... uh, No, I thought I had it written down here. I should write it down. But the word... The Jews said that the baby in the womb was the fish. And they also called it the air. Well, the word fish is the word dog. And the, the word, and the plural is daga. And fish is singular. Singular. Daga is plural. And when you add up the Hebrew letters of the alphabet, dog adds up to seven, daga adds up to 12. I just thought that was interesting. Now, what we're doing, I'm trying to point some things out to you in Revelation. We've, you've got the, the glossary in the first chapter. I will mention this again. The glossary, a glossary, of course, comes from the word glossa, glossa, and we get the word glossary from that. Glossa means foreign language. A glossary is a section of a book that words are foreign that gives you definitions. And then, uh, of course, that's what the first chapter of Revelation is. It is a glossary. It will show you. In fact, you see the seven churches in verse 4, seven spirits in verse 4, And you see in verse 10, you see a great voice as a trumpet. Well, when you see a voice as a trumpet, then you think also uh, over there in the fourth chapter, uh, verse verse 1, I heard, uh, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. So when you think of trumpets, when when you end up in the eighth chapter of Revelation, and you got seven angels and seven trumpets, and they are sounding the trumpets. Think of the angels sounding seven voices, or a refined voice, not particularly seven angels, because the seven angels uh, are the are the seven uh, there in verse twenty of chapter 1. The seven stars are the seven angels. So the seven stars, seven stars equals seven angels equals seven voices. So an angel is the word angelos or messenger. So what this is, this is the refined church speaking with, with a refined voice, and if your voice is refined, then you're going to speak the truth is what you're going to do. You've been seven through a blood baptism. Well, and I've said before, you've got seven churches, and I'm going to go through the seven churches somewhere along the way. I don't know if I'll do it in this series. I want to get back and finish up Second Kings. And you've got uh, the seven churches named in verse 11. Of course, chapters 2 and 3, you have got the seven churches of Asia. In each one of these churches, he'll tell you 
what is wrong with that church, and evidently they need to be seven to be a refined church to be able to speak the truth. Now, probably the most important thing in the first chapter is to see the sevens in it. When you see the seven candlesticks, golden candlesticks in verse 12, verse 13, seven candlesticks, seven stars in the right hand. And whenever you see the right hand, that's not just there because the writer, John, did, or God thought, I'll flower this up and put, say, right hand. Right hand was the hand of authority. We see a right hand here. Let me read this. Verse 16, chapter 1, he had in his right hand seven stars. The right hand was the hand of authority. The Jews said left-handed men were evil. And that's why God said, I'll show you that they're not evil. I'll send you a left-handed man named Ehud, and I'll cause him with his left hand to kill this King Eglon. Uh, and, and he did. And so right hand means hand of authority. Well, when you look over here at chapter 4, I mean chapter 5 of, verse, of Revelation, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, the throne was the Ark of the Covenant, that was a mobile throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Let me just show you what I believe this is talking about. When Christ has in his right hand, right hand, seven stars, we said that the seven stars were the, was the refined message with a refined voice or seven voices. Well, it says right here, the right hand of Christ, there's seven stars. Look at, the, look at that in chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book. So if, if in the right hand is seven stars, but it's a book... I believe that the seven stars is the book. Well, what is the seven stars? It's the refined message. Where does the refined message, where is the message written? On fleshy tables of our hearts. On fleshy tables of our hearts. And that's the book of the law because in the temple... The law was written on tables of stone, and that was called the book of the law. And that was kept inside the Ark of the Covenant. So if in the right hand, in the first chapter, seven stars, and in the right hand, in the fifth chapter, verse 1, is a book, and, and, it's, and the book has seven seals then someone has to be worthy to open the book of our heart and interpret the book of the law. That's why in the fourth chapter, when these 24 elders, which are the 24 sons of Ithamar and Eleazar, the, son, the surviving sons of Aaron, when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, and there in the 24th chapter of 1 Chronicles, verse 2, we find that Ithamar and Eliezer, the high priest, had 24 sons. Well, they come casting these golden crowns to the feet of Jesus because, because when they do that, they're saying, these 24 elders are sons of Ithamar and Eliezer. They are the ones that taught the law and executed the law that was written in the book of the law of God on tables of stone. I want you to see that the seven stars are in the right hand of Christ and the book is in his right hand and stars is the message. Where's the book, where's the message coming from? It's coming from our heart and the scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the trumpet speaketh, the mouth speaketh, the voice speaketh. 
this is allegorical language to point out to you. Don't think that he's got something in his right hand one place and he's got something in his right hand another place and there's something different. This is really simpler than people realize if you understand that the, that the 24 elders, they executed the book of the law that was written on tables of stone. Now the law is written on fleshy tables with a heart and they have these golden mitres or crowns on their head from the 28th chapter of Exodus and they're saying, we're not worthy and capable since your resurrection and you are the true high priest of God. That's what Hebrews, the 10th chapter, tells us. We're not capable of executing the the book of the law written on men's hearts. So what we're going to do is come and acquiesce to you as the true high priest. Here are our crowns. You execute the law of God. Those crowns were to show who the executors of the law of God was. And what he's saying, what they're saying is we're not capable of doing that. And they cried out, is anyone worthy in heaven to open this book? in our hearts, and when we become sevened, that's Christ working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure, to cause you to trumpet or to voice the message of God, and you won't do that till you go through a blood baptism till you're sevened. I hope that's not... Did I lose you there? Does that make sense? It's the only thing that makes sense. Now, I may come back and say, boy, I'm dry. Uh, I may say some of these things over and over, unless y'all already got it. <laughs> y'all got it? One good question. I don't have my notes here, but the four twenty elders is found in Exodus. Exodus, the 28th chapter. We'll look at it one more time. I'll go ahead and read it since I said it so much. Uh, Turn over to Exodus 28. And here's the whole point. Exodus 28. Exodus 28. The Scripture said these 24 elders had golden crowns on their heads. I really want you to understand this. These, there are 28 courses set up. Uh, well, I was going to show you that. There's 20... Four courses set up by, by David because there were 24 families that had the book of the law. And here's the gold crowns. I've said this before. Nobody's commented to me. There, it's not, we're going to cast our crowns at Jesus' feet. Fooey. That's not what this is talking about. This is talk. well, let me show you the 24 elders one more time. First Chronicles, the 24th chapter. First Chronicles 24. Here's the 24 elders. The 24 elders are the 24 sons of Aaron. When you started talking about the temple, this was one of the most commonly understood things concerning the temple that all Jews knew about. It's not some secret thing. If you read Edersheim or anybody else, any number of these guys will mention this over and over. Well, here in the 24th chapter... Uh, of First Chronicles, and these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. He had four sons, Aaron, uh, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Nadab and Abihu died before their father because they offered strange fire, and Eleazar and Ithamar were left to execute the priest's office. And what they do, did, they were the ones that went inside once a year, and they had a course of high priests, and they would go inside the holy place or inside the, the oracle, inside where the ark was, and they would minister the book of the law that was in... They would minister to the people the law of God that was written on tables of stone, and the tables of stone were kept inside the ark of the covenant. So they were ministering that law that was in the book of God. That's what they were doing. And we see the book in the right hand of Christ, that is his authority. We are his authority upon the earth, and it's in his right hand. It's seven stars, and it's a little book. And the seven stars are the seven messengers 
or the refined message coming from our hearts. It's what he's talking about. And then he says here in verse, in chapter 24, verse 4, and there were more chief men found of the sons of Eleazar than of the sons of Ithamar, and thus were they divided among the sons of Eleazar, the high priest of God, who was going to take the place of Aaron, were sixteen chief men, and the house of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Ithamar, uh, when you add eight and sixteen, you have twenty-four. This is the twenty-four courses, and he starts naming them down here, uh, and of course remember that that uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was in the eighth course. He was a high priest. The high priest in Israel should have been John the Baptist, not uh, Caiaphas or Annas. And if you see verse 10, the seventh to Hakaz, the eighth to Abijah, and when you read the first chapter of Luke, uh, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, was of the eighth course. And he was serving uh, in the high priesthood uh, in the temple at that time when John was conceived. And, uh, and back over here in 28th chapter of Exodus, Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. This is the gold plates or the gold crowns they had on their heads as it says there in uh, the fourth verse of Revelation, the fourth chapter, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders clothed in white raiment, and the high priest always wore white linen garments when they went to do their duty, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And the, here's the crowns of gold in the 28th chapter, verse 26, Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it holiness to the Lord. All of the slaves, anyone who was leaders for uh, some world ruler or for some uh, feudal type lord, he would have somewhere upon his body either a strap around him or a, his ear pierced through with an awl or a mark on his forehead or he would have upon his forehead. Now this is the mark on the forehead of the high priest, they've got a gold plate, and thou shalt put on it blue lace, that it may upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead. Here is gold on his forehead, a crown, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. So, it's upon the forehead of these priests, the 24 elders, and these 24 elders search through Israel and through the heavens for someone to open the book, the sealed book in the right hand of Christ. Well, that's the seven angels or the refined voice of God. And what is God's voice upon the earth? The it's the church. This is metaphoric. It's what it is. It's idiomatic language. It's allegorical. It's a figure. It's what it is. A figure of speech. And when we speak, that's the voice of God. But see, we have a high priest over the house of God. Let's look at that over in Hebrews. Go in Hebrews, the 10th chapter. Hebrews 10. Here's the high priest. Verse 19, Having therefore brethren... Now this is the temple. We're the temple of God now. Our hearts are the ark of the covenant, and God is written on fleshy tables of the heart. Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest, that is the inner sanctuary where the ark of the covenant is kept, by the blood of Jesus, not by the blood of a goat, as we find in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. By a new and living way, and that word is hodos, and we go through the narrow hodos, and Jesus said, I am the hodos, I am the way, and the, it's narrow, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 
well, his flesh we find uh, the, that the veil is, his bo- is the bread over in John 6 and that the bread is the body and the body is the church of the wife of Christ. So we're the veil and inside of us is the book of the law written on fleshy tables with the heart and the 24 high priests of Aaron's sons, Ithamor and Eliezer, they, when they cast their crowns at the feet of Christ, they're not going, you're just mighty and Lord, we cast our crowns. What they're saying is, here are our crowns, we can't interpret this book that's written on men's hearts. So they cast their crowns to him. What are they casting them to him for? Here, you put on the crowns because you're the true high priest. That's what they're saying. We can't interpret the book of the law written on men's hearts. And it's an allegorical picture. I I said last week, I like what Mr. Fairburn says. The book of Revelation is written like a political cartoon. That's what it's written like. If you see a picture of the White House and you see a picture of a donkey kicking an elephant off the front steps, anyone who knows anything about politics knows that that means that the Democrats, who are represented by a donkey, have kicked the Republicans out of the House, or if it says Congress up there, and you see a donkey kicking an elephant out of Congress, it means what it would mean was that the Democrats now have a majority and they've thrown out the Republican vote. That's the way this book is written. It's written like political cartoons when you get into the scorpions and you get into the, the beast with seven heads and ten horns and the dragon has seven heads and ten horns and the dragon and the beast are going to be one and the same. So when you get to chapter 5, what you're seeing... I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open this book in the right hand of Christ. The right hand is his authority and his authority upon the earth is his word and it's written in our hearts. Isn't it? Is this, am I losing? I don't want to lose you. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It's saying, who has the authority to open the book of the law that's written in our hearts? Only one. And that's Christ. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And when a book, when you're talking about a book, it's not talking about something that looked like this. It was a scroll. It was rolled up and it had an official seal on it and they had a signet ring. We we use the word signature. Well, a signet was was a ring of authority and the king usually wore it on his right hand. He would stamp it in clay or in hot wax, and he would seal that book. And unless somebody had the authority to open it, uh, there was a penalty for opening, especially a government book or a government piece of mail. You could die for opening uh, the mail of a Roman Caesar. So... Where was I? Where am I going to go? All right. I, want, I don't want to read. Well, let's go ahead and read verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the throne, remember, remember the throne? The throne is the Ark of the Covenant. A judgment seat is a mobile throne, and they would move that around depending on where the, the fire by day, or, or fire by night, and the cloud by day was going. When it moved, that was God moving. And then when it stopped, they would set the Ark, they would set up the the temple right under it and God would come down out of the Shekinah glory cloud and sit down on the Ark of the Covenant and rule Israel from there and the high priest on the Day of Atonement would come in 
And the high priest would rule all the people of Israel with the book of the law that was written on tables of stone inside the Ark of the Covenant. Now there has to be another high priest. And we see, well, I didn't read that, re finish reading that in Hebrews. In Hebrews, here's the high priest of God. We enter in by a new and living way. And then in Matthew, I mean Hebrews, the 10th chapter, through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. There's only one high priest now. He's not of the Aaronic priesthood. He's of the Melchizedek priesthood. And what is the house of God as we find over there in Hebrews 3 and verse 6? But Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we? So what he's talking about here is someone to open the book, and let's go ahead and read the rest of this. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne are the Ark of the Covenant, and the Ark now is our hearts. You can't study this book with showing, with showing, without showing the Old Testament law, the Old Testament uh, temple of God, the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant, and then showing the corresponding spiritual over here in the new. So do you, I want to just stop and ask you, do you see what he's saying? We see the seven stars are the refined message of God in his right hand, and we see the book of the law in his, we see the book written on tables, space, on uh, fleshy tables of the heart in his right hand. The book of the law is coming from our hearts, and that's the refined message of God. The key is the word right hand. When you see, and take your McClunic and Strong and look up right hand, and it will tell you it's the hand of authority. We are God's authority upon earth because his word is coming from our mouths. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns or powers, and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into the earth. Well, what are these seven spirits? We see the seven spirits from chapter 1. And uh, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. The throne is our hearts. The spirit of God is in us. When it says seven spirits, it means the refined what? Seven would be refined, wouldn't it? Seven spirits. Seven would be refined. What is the word spirit? And what is it? Truth, the refined truth coming from our mouths. This is a lot of algebra, in case you don't know it, isn't it, Mike? This is a lot of algebra. What we're doing is we're substituting equals for equals, and the results is equal. That's all this is. And you have to see if, if well, I won't go into it. I started to give you an algebra equation. don't want to give it to you all that don't. Didn't do good in algebra. Okay, now, uh, look here in, let's finish reading here. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to, uh, to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, if it's a sealed book, do you know what a sealed book is? If it's sealed, well, yes, but... Something is sealed, it is secret. Or it is a, a mystery, 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 R-M-U-S-T-E-R, 
F-A-C-T-I-O-N. It means the facts are being hidden until God opens it. Now, when he opens out of the abundance of the heart where the book of the law is written, the mouth will speak. That's good there. Out of the book, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the book that's written in our hearts, the mouth will trumpet the word of God. And only when we become seven will he open our mouths. And that's when you start maturing, when he opens your mouth and causes you to be the seven spirit or the, in the seven candlesticks. The spirit, when you have the candlesticks, I don't think I emphasized this and made this plain enough. I've said it a couple times. You have the candlesticks... which is the seven are refined church have the refined church then you have the seven stars which is which equals the seven angels are the refined message and all of it is refined because it is sevened or it goes through a blood baptism. All this is about a blood baptism is what it is. You remember, Naaman had to be dipped seven times, right? Seven, this is... You say, Jim, you nearly lose me on some of this. You have to get out of a 20th, 21st century way of thinking. You got to think the way they thought. When you go into a foreign country, I'm sure... If you go into another culture, don't. If you go into Germany, Mike, don't you have some ways of thinking you got to get into as opposed to our way of thinking here? Yeah. Because when they say things, they mean something different when they say it. When you go into England, even speaking the same language, when they say certain words, some words that we just consider everyday language, it might be a curse word in England. So you have to get to thinking the way they thought. Seven is taking an oath, going through a blood baptism. And, but when you get into the seven spirits, the, the Scripture will teach us that the seven spirits is the seven truth. Well, that is when you have the candlesticks. You got the candlesticks... And you got the seven stars, which is the message. But when you combine the two, when you put the oil, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit, inside the candlesticks, and when you light them, that's considered to be the seven spirits when they're lit and they're shining. When we're shining, we are seven, we are the seven spirit of God when we're preaching the word of God. We're seven. Now... Where was I here? And they sung, verse 9, they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book in the right hand and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and you've made us unto our God kings and priests." And we shall reign on the earth, and we're reigning right now in the kingdom of God upon the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands. Well, this is what it's talking about in the seventh chapter. In the seventh chapter, when we see... Uh, in verse 9, After this I beheld in law a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, and clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And when you get down here to verse 13, uh, 
And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and which came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These are the seven people of God. It's what they are. They have a blood baptism. They have been completed, and they are seven, and uh, they have been sevened by God in a blood baptism. Go back to verse 12. After he says thousands of thousands, these are the many, and even thousands of thousands is going to be millions, but that's a very small amount compared to what's in the world. It will still be few compared to the total number that will enter in the straight gate saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. I believe the word is axio. A-X-I-O-O. We get the word axiom. It means something that has authority. The, the laws of mathematics have the authority to dictate what the truth about math is. In the word axiao or axios, we get the word worthy. That is the word worthy, and that has the authority. It means something that has authority. Without axioms in mathematics, you have no mathematics, do you, Mike? Without laws, there is no mathematics. That is what is worthy, and that's what he's saying here. You remember the word mathetes? That is the word disciple, and that word mathetes uh, means to learn. Well, how are you going to learn math if you don't have mathematical laws? You're not going to learn, are you, at all? Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, all that are in them heard and I sang, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts which had the faces of a lion, the face of a man, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. These are the cherubim we talked about, and these are the four. Anytime you see these four beasts, you had four beasts. Let me show you this. Now, I've gone over this, but sometimes I have to repeat it to read another verse. You got four beasts. Each one of them has the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle, and the face of an ox. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, you got four beasts. Four beasts. And that doesn't mean something evil, four beasts. You had inside the the temple of God, you had the veil here, and you had on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, you had a cherubim, or you can call it cherubim, C-H-E-R-A-B-I-M, and these are the four beasts, because they were the cherubim, or the cherubim, and you had two of them, one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, and two of them embossed or woven into that veil, that eight-inch thick veil there. So you had four of them before the throne of God here. You have four beasts, a man, a lion, an eagle, and an ox. In Genesis, the ninth chapter, when Noah goes into the ark, God says, I'm going to uh, perform a covenant with the beast of the field, and, and the king of the beast is the lion, with the birds of the air, with the cattle of the field, the representative of the cattle is the ox, representative of the birds of the air, or the fowl of the air, is the eagle and man. When you find these four beasts, what you're finding is you're finding a picture of the covenant of God, and this is 
figurative, allegorical language. You're seeing God's protective covenant. And he's not going to protect us in this world and make us rich and healthy here. We're not to fear him that can destroy the body, but we're to fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. So God is going to protect us and bring us through all of this, and we will survive spiritually, and we'll get a new body to go with our souls one day. So when you see the four, when you see four angels or four beasts, it's talking, these were messengers of God, and these first four beasts open the first four seals, and you've got the first four seals of white horse, white horse, and he has a bow in his hand, and then you have a red horse, red horse, and he has a sword, and then you have a black horse, and this man has scales showing you, uh, bringing, showing you how much, how high that it's going to take to feed men three measures of barley for a penny, a denarius, a day's wages of a, of a Roman soldier, a field hand, and, th and one measure of wheat for a penny. So what we see on the fourth one is famine, and then the third one is a pale horse, and that he, death and hell ride with him, and we see plague and pestilence. Huh? H-O-R-S. What'd you say? Okay, so you see plague or pestilence, and what you see, the four horsemen of the apocalypse have been riding for thousands of years. This is not some future thing with some evil, real, literal horseman riding out of some cloud. That's stupid. This is a political cartoon. It's what it is. And we here you have the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. The white horse always commanding generals wore rode these white horses and in order for the white horse to correlate with these second three, it has to be an evil system or the beast system that was the fourth judgment of God after the sword, the famine, the pestilence. It's but if I've never heard anybody preach on the four judge four judgments of God out of the Old Testament. Except myself. I've never heard anybody talk about sword, famine, pestilence, and beast. And it's all over the Old Testament, especially in the book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So this is fairly simple. If, you, if you're not looking for fire and smoke out, coming out of a literal pit with bombs exploding and nuclear warheads and helicopters going, you know, if you're not looking for that, it's not that hard. And speaking of the bottomless pit, Let's stop and look at that because in order to understand all this, it takes, let's just take time and look at the pit. Let's go, you got several times, let's go to Revelation 9 and 1. Let's, let me read to you and let me write this down as we go where you find this pit, Okay. All right. All right, look at Revelation 9 and 1. This is the first place the bottomless pit is mentioned. Revelation 9 and verse 1. Now, 8, 9, and 10. I was telling the guys over at the house the other night. I said, I look at books as a picture. And I look at sections of the books. I can't even explain to you. I'm trying to. Um, I've been looking at the book of Hebrews for a long time, not just recently. And, I, and we, you remember we talked about how the rest of God is in the third and fourth chapter, and that's the spiritual Sabbath. And then immediately before he gets out of the fourth chapter, he introduces you to Melchizedek, and then he goes out of Melchizedek into, into uh, those that need to go on into perfection. Strong meat belongs to those that are full age. And he talks about how that if we don't leave the basic principles and go into perfection, 
that, that it's impossible if we fall away as believers to have brand new repentance. We live having put Christ in open shame. And then immediately he goes right back to Melchizedek in the seventh chapter. He talks about the priest. Now, here you are. Spiritual rest. This is the way I picture books. Spiritual rest, three and four. Uh, f the end of five and six, the apostate believer that goes off and it brings you right back to Melchizedek. So I'm thinking, what are high priests for offering the blood? And that's in our hearts. He sprinkles the blood of Christ. And then at the end of chapter 6, he goes right back into Melchizedek all the way through chapter 7. And then in chapter 8, he starts talking about the patterns. And in chapter 9, the patterns and tells you all about the patterns of the temple of God and then he goes back into the high priest in the 10th chapter. And what I do when I study books, I'm trying to get the significance right now about why he put the apostate believer right between talking about Melchizedek and going right back to it. You see what I'm saying? These books are woven is what they are. Now, do I think I have a great understanding of all this? I understand a lot of this better than most doctors of theology I've ever seen, but I don't believe I have a great understanding. What I do is I isolate. What I like to do is I like to take segments and isolate them, and that's what we're going to do with the bottomless pit. Let's look at the bottomless pit, and let's isolate it and set it off by itself. Set these things off in sections, and you'll see it. Take your concordance and set it off. Show every time it's mentioned. Look here in Revelation 9 and 1. 9 and 1. Now, 8, 9, and 10, you've got seven angels are the refined message of God coming from the seven angels, which, and they, and the seven candlesticks. The angels is a picture of the oil inside the lamps inside the, the candlesticks. Well, you got seven angels sounding in 8, 9, and 10. And this is, and when the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God is finished in the 10th chapter in verse 7. And this is the fifth angel sounding. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. What's that? What's the star falling to the earth? Well, look here. Look here. The star falling to the earth. Chapter 1. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 16. Let me just show you this. Let me write this up here. Star. The fifth angel sounds. Fifth angel, the fifth angel of seven angels, right? Because the seven angels in the eighth chapter have got seven trumpets or seven voices or a sevened voice, right? And what are the seven angels? The seven, the seven stars. Right? And if a star is falling to the earth, star falls at the fifth angel, out of fifth out of seven, and what are the seven, where are the seven stars? In the right hand of Christ? And what else does he have in his right hand? The little book. The little book that's written in our hearts is being spoken out and falling to the earth and bringing judgment on the earth. I can't tell you enough how allegorical this is. It's total allegory is what it is. That's why everybody says, this is an impossible book. Not if you go back and find out and match these things up. Now, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him who is this angel what's the glossary chapter 1 
This is one of seven angels, and the seven angels are the seven spirits of the seven churches. This is the oil inside the candlesticks. This is the voice of you and I when we have been sevened. Speaking to, this is the judgment falling to the earth. Remember the heavens was the ruling class and the earth was the ruled. I don't mean we're preaching to the ground. We're preaching to the ruled, and we're ruling them with a rod of righteousness, with a scepter of righteousness. And I saw, and the angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. That's our voices preaching to the people we are ruling. And we're ruling the unbelievers. And to him, to us... To you and I are, is given a key when we are sevened to the bottomless pit. Well, bottomless pit, one more time, is the word A-B-U-S-S-O-S. -S -S. We get the word A-B-Y-S-S -S -S from that, abyss, but it has an exact meaning. It is a construction of the word bathos. Bathos. Now, the word bathos means something with pro, F-U-N-D-I-T-Y. Profundity means, we get the word profound from that. Profound means something with, man, he is profound. He has great understanding of physics or chemistry. It means something with great intellectual depth. Of course, when you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, it negates the word as a negative particle and gives an opposite meaning. Abathos or abusos means something with no intellectual depth or something that has no knowledge. What's a word that means no knowledge? Well, I'm thinking of... Well, that does mean no knowledge. I'm thinking of a word that everybody likes. Nice. 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 When people are nice to you, when they act nice... The word nice is N-I-S-C-E-R-E. -E. You're right, Mike. Brutus does mean, but it means more than no knowledge. It means stupid and you're unable to learn. Nice is the French word nisquer. It comes from nay and S-C-E-R-E. -E. Nay means no. Skier is our word science. Or it means knowledge. When a man acts nice, he plays dumb. And he acts like he doesn't know. Well, the, uh, the abyss is the place of no knowledge. Now, let's just read a little bit. Let me go back. Let me... We'll come back to this. Let me go back. Let me go to the other verses in verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, or the place of no knowledge... And there arose a smoke out of the pit. It sure does sound like some literal pit. Now, if you listen to Hal Lindsey or that ignoramus Perry Stone, golly. Whew. He's a disaster. He's got a whole lot of props and lots of things that somebody's given him and lots of money to build props, but he doesn't have very good sense. And there rose smoke out of the pit. Now, what's the smoke from the pit? It's pride is what it is because when you go over here to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy and 6th chapter, 6th chapter of 1 uh, Timothy, Speaking of the doctrine of Christ, 
that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. The word doctrine, didache, means instruction. Verse 2, they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And if any man teach otherwise, otherwise than the doctrine of Christ, that word otherwise is hetero didaskaleo. Hetero means other, didaskaleo means doctrine. And if he consents not to wholesome words, that's the word hugi I know, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, a man who doesn't teach the truth, he is proud. Of course, the word proud is the word T-U-P-H-L-O-S, two floss, And it comes from the word T-U-P-H-O-O. This word tuflos means to be slowly consumed by a smoke with no fire. Excuse me, that's the word tufao. The word proud, it means to be slowly consumed by a smoke with no fire when... You're preaching a lie. You're blowing smoke is what you're doing. And the man is proud. When it comes from the word tuflos, that word is the word blind. So smoke out of the place of no knowledge is the kingdoms of this world where they have no knowledge or no truth. And that's, what's, that's the place of no knowledge And there's a smoke coming out of this place of no knowledge or bottomless pit. Right? Then he says, As the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of smoke from the pit. Well, the sun is darkened. He's going on further here. Hold on a second. I've got a piece of paper I want to show you. He goes on and he starts talking about the scorpions in the pit. Now, we've talked about the scorpions. Hold on. Here it is. Nope, that ain't it. All right. He's talking about the smoke from the pit. Now, In verse 3, there came out of the smoke, which came out of the pit, the smoke is proud man, there came locusts. Now, the locust is going to explain the darkening of the, the darkening of verse 2, the smoke of the great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened. Now, he compares what's coming out of the pit are scorpion-like creatures that that are similar to locusts. Now, the locust was the greatest plague when God would send famine. In the first chapter of Joel, Joel talks about God sending locusts and the palmer worm to eat up the crop. A locust could come to a great huge tree and could strip it of every leaf in less than 15 minutes. And the locusts weren't what we call a seven-year Katie did, or cicada, a locust were some grasshopper-like creatures six to eight inches long, and they would devour everything in the land. What is this a picture of? It's a picture of false teachers devouring the true crop of God when the Scripture says in the eighth chapter of Amos that there's going to be a famine, but not of bread, And it won't be a famine of no literal water. It'll be a famine of the Word of God. That's what Amos says. And these are false teachers because he goes on to say that these locusts unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power and it's comparing them with scorpions. Now... When you don't understand what this means, scorpion, don't listen to Hal Lindsey when Hal Lindsey says, when Hal Lindsey says, 
These uh, sound like helicopters to me. Whew. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. It's total idiocy. What you do is you take your concordance and you look up scorpion. That's what you do. It doesn't take a brilliant man to, in a Strong's exhaustive concordance to look up the word scorpion. So you look up here. Let me just do this for you. Scorpions. You've got scorpion in Luke eleven twelve, Revelation 9 and 5, and then you've got scorpions in Deuteronomy 8, 15, 1 Kings 12 and 11, 12 and 14, 2 Chronicles 10 and 11, 2 Chronicles 10 and 14, and then you've got scorpions in Ezekiel, the second chapter. Let's go over there and look at that. 2 and 6 of Ezekiel. And it doesn't take a genius to do this. It takes a concordance. Ezekiel 2 and Two here in verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them. Now, Ezekiel is being held captive in Babylon. It's due to all the false teaching in Israel that God carried them away when they went after Baal in the grove. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. It's talking about Israel, the false teachers over there. Scorpion is the word scorpizo, S-K-O-R. And we're still talking about the bottomless pit. The word scorpion is scorpios, and you have a noun, then you have a verb form of the noun, and the verb form is S-K-O-R-P-I-Z-O, scorpizo. Now, when you look up this word scorpion, here's what you do. You, you look at the word scorpion in the New Testament, 4651. You look up 4651 in the back of your concordance in the Greek, 4651. I'm just doing it for you to show what you do. 46, did I say 51? Yeah, 46, 51. Scorpion. Scorpios. It means to pierce. A scorpion from its sting, meaning to pierce. What is another word that means to pierce? Do you remember? Huh? the word persecute. Persecute means you're running from an enemy. It's the word dokeo. It means to pierce or to be in flight from it, to run from it or to pierce. And, from, and we also have the word P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. Now, that word parasmos is the word try. It means to go through a trial when Peter said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Well, a derivative of the word parasmos is the word P-E-I-R-A. That word means to. And did they not pierce Jesus' hands and feet and his side? This is a picture of us going through the piercing and it is scorpions that pierce us. And the verb form of scorpion is scorpizo. And when you look at the previous verse, when you look this up in your concordance, you looked up 4651. In 4651, scorpios, the word scorpion, 
Look back at 4650, Scorpizo, with the idea of penetrating or put to flight. In meaning, it has the same meaning as the word para or pirazzo, which comes from the word parasmos, which is the word to try or go through a trial. It's false teachers who persecuted Jesus and killed him. It was false teachers who were trying to kill the prophets. And it will be false teachers, religious people who are coming after us. Now, if you want to see the word for the word scorpizo, you take 4650 and you look up 4650, which is the word scorpizo, in your in your word study concordance, look up 4650. How much time do I have? 19. I need more time. 4650. Now, here is the word, the verb form of scorpion. Now, if Hal Lindsey would do this, of course, Hal Lindsey says scorpions are helicopters. That makes all this, that flies in the face of all reality. That's idiocy. Scorpions are all these false teachers in these churches preaching false doctrine. You dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words. Now, let me just give you the verb forms of scorpion. Look here in Matthew 12. Go to Matthew 12. So out, out of the bottomless pit is coming false teachers out of a place with no knowledge, when a man has no knowledge, the only thing that keeps him going is his pride because he's blind. Isn't that right? He's blind. Now look here, Matthew 12 and 30. Here is the verb form of scorpion. Comes from the word scorpion. Matthew 12 and verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. You're either with Christ or against him. That's why he tells us to come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing and I'll receive you. He that gathereth not with me, soon ago, S-U-N-A-G-O, we get the word synagogue from that. That word soon ago means to assemble or to gather together. The only way we are supposed to gather together is in the fellowship of his suffering. And if you don't do that, don't gather together with other people who are suffering for persecution for Christ, then you're against Christ. People say, I'm going to go off out here by myself and I'll just kind of wander around, go from church to church, and I'll just kind of wander around with, with Christians and I'll have no instruction and no fellowship with people who are going through fiery trials. They're scattering the flock. He that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. You're either for me or against me, Jesus said, and you will fellowship with those people who are in righteousness or you are against me, scattering the flock. And that word scatter is the verb form of scorpion. You find this same verse... In Luke eleven twenty three, he that gathereth not with me scatters abroad. And then in John 10 and 12, let's go to John 10. Sometimes I've, I hope, I know that people here can understand what I'm saying. I'm probably losing somebody that's seen us for the first time on TV. John 10 and verse 12. Well, let's read down to it. Verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. This is allegorical picture of sheep. Abundance of life for sheep is green pastures. That's the word of God. This is not talking about he wants to have abundance of life. He wants to have lots of money. Well, if the sheep, if the money's real, if the abundance is real money, then these are real sheep and this is a real shepherd and that's a real doer. This is the parable of the good shepherd. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, the man who works for money is a false teacher. 
he's a scorpion whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The word scattereth is the word scorpizo, the verb form of scorpion. Scorpions are false teachers, hirelings that work for money, scattering the flock. And look here in second. I look at 16, John 16, John 16, verse 32. 1632. Behold, the hour cometh, and Je this is Jesus' last discourse to the apostles the night before he died. The hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, and that is the verb form, scorpizo of scorpion. And then let's look at 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians. It just takes proving the Scripture with Scripture. Use your word study concordance. It's a tremendous help. Look at 2 Corinthians 9. Second Corinthians 9 and verse 9. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Dispersed abroad is the word scorpizo. And what these evil scorpions are, they are false teachers coming out of the place of no knowledge, out of the bottomless pit. Now, let's, uh, let me give you one other verse here on scorpions. Uh, look here in... Luke 10. Let's go to Luke 10. Luke 10. That is what... This is a good Pentecostal verse. Charismatics like this verse. This thrills them to death. Uh, when you get around a charismatic... I heard a lady use this on, on TV one day. And uh, Luke 10. Yeah, Luke, I'm in Luke 11. No wonder I'm going to find it. 10 and verse 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, or to walk upon serpents were also another title for evil men. Scorpions is a title for evil men. I saw a silly woman on... TBN one day say, well, God said he gave us power over serpents and scorpions, and I had a bunch, bunch of ants up in my cupboard, and I went in there, and I claimed the blood of Jesus on these ants and told them to, to cast out, to be gone. You dummy. <laughs> and why wouldn't they say that? Because they think God has given us power to step on scorpions. I used to step on scorpions when I wasn't even spiritual. I lived in Fort Worth, and if I saw one, I'd go over and stomp it. I had the power then. Must have had the Holy Ghost then. It's that idiocy. Whew. Power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you spiritually. That's what he's talking about. Let's get back over here, and let's look at the bottomless pit, and I'll come back and finish this on scorpions and about their tormenting men seven months. I will go ahead, and five months, I will go ahead and say this. When it says that, that, but they, shall, that they should torment, uh, the, these evil men shall be tormented five months. Remember, the scorpion is compared with the locust. And the sun was hidden, the writers tell us that these locusts were larvae in the ground, and they'd come out of the ground, and for 20 miles, you could see this pestilence coming, and the scorpions were so thick in the air, only God knows how high, half a mile deep, and they completely blocked, these locusts completely blocked the light of the sun and the land would be dark for miles. What the spiritual scorpions do, or the false teachers, they have no knowledge, and in their pride, 
they get in their pulpits and they block the light, the Son of God coming in. That's what they do. And God used an allegory that all those people in that day and time would understand that locusts would block the light of the sun and the spirit and the evil locusts or the scorpions block the, in their pride. They know nothing. They're destitute of the truth and they consent not to hold some words and they block the light of God and they do it what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, look at that. Here's how the scorpions block the light. Jeremiah 23, it just hit me. This is a good verse here. Jeremiah 23, here's how they block the light. When they stand in the pulpit, they refuse to tell the truth. And he says in verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They steal the Word of God because they won't say it, and they're blocking the light, and there's darkness, and it's because the pride, the smoke the man's blowing from the pulpit of some fancy church because he lacks his big salary. That's what scorpions are. A friend of mine said he was talking to an Arab out here at, at college one day, and he said, this Arab told him, he said, I got to talking to him, and I asked him, I said, we got to talking about con artists and guys who are real slick. He said, I asked him, well, what do you call a man like that over in the Middle East? He said, we call him a scorpion. That's still a standard word for a crook. We call him a snake in the grass, but that doesn't mean he's literally a snake crawling around in the grass. Scorpion is the name of a, a lying con artist, some slick guy who's trying to get what he wants. That's what these are. I'm going to come back and finish the rest of this. Let's look at the rest of these. Let's look at the rest. Let me set this aside here. Set that aside. And a scorpion was also a whip in the Old Testament. Here's what's funny. A scorpion was the predecessor of the Roman flagellum. You remember when when uh, Rehoboam became king after Solomon, after when the God was splitting the throne, splitting the kingdom. Rehoboam became king, and his buddies came to him, and they said, "You tell these people that you're the king, and you tell these old men that are trying to tell you to be easier." He said, "You tell them that your father beat them with whips, but you'll you'll beat them with a scorpion." Scorpion was the predecessor to the Roman cat of nine tails. It was a short whip with leather thongs and it had pieces of glass and bone and that was called a scourge and God would scourge Israel with the scorpions. He said he'll scourge Israel with the Babylonians and they were the scorpions. And what is amazing, the Babylonians are scorpions and they're compared with spiritual locusts and the Bible says he will send a great east wind against Israel. And when you study the locusts, the biologists and scientists say that the locusts were blown into Israel by an east wind. Because the locusts had to come from out in the desert and they blew in by an east wind. And Babylon was called an east wind that came in and it was called a scourge. Notice how all this stuff ties together. Now, let's, let's look at the rest of the bottomless pit. Look at 9-11. 9-11 of Revelation. Remember, the bottomless pit doesn't change in meaning. 9-11. <clears throat> In speaking of the scorpions, they had a king over them, which is the angel or the messenger of the place of no knowledge whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon and Apollyon was the serpent was the serpent god of the ancient world what's, what's amazing is the word Apollyon we get the word A P 
was it two P's? A P O L L A P O L L U M I. Do you remember that word Apollo me? It's the word lost or perish. And Apollyon was the serpent god in the ancient world. That was one of the serpent gods. And of course, that's just a picture of Satan, and he's the king of the bottomless pit. He's the king of the place of no knowledge. He's the man that he's the one that tells them uh, where to, what to say. Look here at, look at. Uh, well, I read the wrong verse. But no, that was the right verse. Yeah. Okay, nine eleven. Now look at Revelation eleven. The bottomless pit is always the same. Revelation eleven. And verse 7, and when they have finished their testimony, who is this? This is the two witnesses, isn't it? How this all ties together, it would take me all night long just to preach the bottomless pit. Take me all night till tomorrow morning. Because they... This is the two olive trees that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. When they, let me go ahead and read this and explain it. When they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The beast is coming out of the bottomless pit, isn't it? Beast out of the place of no knowledge. Have you noticed how nobody likes knowledge? They don't like information? This beast, this bottomless pit is all over the earth. What is the beast? It's the world ruling system in Daniel, the seventh chapter, Hosea, the 13th chapter, Revelation 13 and 2, or 13, 1 and 2. It's the beast with seven heads and ten horns. And in Daniel 7, the beast was here in Daniel 7. Do you think the beast is coming out of a hole in the ground with a bunch of smoke? The beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Well, it's called a beast because Babylon is equated as the lion, Persia equated as the bear, Greece is equated as the leopard, and God tells Israel in Hosea 13, I'll meet you like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. It is a world ruling system, not a man. Revelation 13, 1 and 2, when you see the beast coming out of the sea, the sea is the waters where the woman sits, isn't it? Look here. Let me just show you this. Let me connect this. Look here in Revelation 13, 13 and 2. The beast I saw was like a leopard. That's Persia. I mean, that's Greece. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. That's Persia. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the composite of these three was the Roman Empire. And the lion was Babylon. But when you back up, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea. The sea, this is figurative. Having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. The reason the beast was rising out of the sea is because the boundaries of these empires was upon the great sea and as far as they were concerned, this was the biggest sea on the face of the earth. They knew nothing about the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Nobody had gone over yet and dropped off the earth. So this was the biggest water in the world to them. That was the Great Sea. That's why it's got Great Sea here, Mediterranean. And all of the systems that ruled the world, the beast, had their borders upon the sea. So the beast rises out of the sea. The beast rises out of the peoples of the earth. It was a place of no knowledge. The sea here is equivalent to the abyss or to the bottomless pit. Can you see that? Huh? And something else that's equivalent to the bottomless pit, you'll find in Revelation 17, Revelation 17 and 1, and there, 
the beast is rising out in chapter 13. The beast is coming out of many waters in Revelation 17, but it's got the harlot Babylon riding upon her. It doesn't mean because it doesn't have the harlot, because it doesn't say the harlot is upon her in chapter 13. It doesn't mean she's not upon her. What they're talking about is emphasizing the beast in chapter 13. Chapter 17, they're emphasizing Babylon, the harlot, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, the one that says, let us make us a name. Now look at 17, verse 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. What are the seven angels? (laughs) Glossary, chapter 1. The seven messengers are the seven stars. It's the book in the right hand of Christ, right? There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. That sitteth upon many waters. She's on the head of the beast in chapter 13 rising up. It's not emphasizing her in chapter 13. That's why she's not mentioned. But it doesn't mean she's not upon the beast. Always Babylon has been upon the beast. But we're emphasizing the harlot here, and she sets upon many waters. Well, the sea in 13 and 1 is a picture of the abyss, and the waters in 17 and 1 is a picture of the abyss because when you read verse 15... And he saith unto me, The waters where the, which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth. She sits upon many waters in verse 1 of 17. The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues, and they have no knowledge. These are the waters of the beast. The beast sits upon these waters. And it doesn't mean the beast rises literally out of the water. She rises out of the waters because the waters, that's the main marketing system of the world there where they take goods around to the different ports. The beast sits upon the waters. So you've got the bottomless pit being a picture of the sea where the beast is rising out of in 13 and 1. In 17 and 1, it's the waters where she sits in the waters is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And this is a place of no knowledge back in this day and time. The only knowledge was in the hearts of the believers that were preaching the gospel. So the beast is rising up out of the pit. The scorpion is rising up out of the pit. <sighs> Look here in... Uh, 17 and 8. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not. I'm not going to go into that right now. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. When it ascends out of the place of no knowledge in chapter 11, it attacks the two witnesses, which is the church or the priest and the king. I've gone through that before. I'll go back through it, though. And look, now let's, now where you really nail this down, I have to go through each one of these to a great extent. Do I have time? Let me just read the last verse for you. When you get to the 20th chapter, it's still the same bottomless pit, the place of no knowledge. 20 and 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit. This is not hell. It's not a hole in the ground with smoke coming out of it. It's a place where Babylon, Persia, Persia, Greece, and Rome rose out of, and they didn't have any knowledge, did they? No. The only ones they had knowledge that had knowledge was the ones they were oppressing, the Jewish believers that they took into captivity. And a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, Dracon, the fascinator, the one who enchanted, 
that old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years, except it's not the word thousand, it's the word kilia. Can you Now, he bound him where? In the place of no knowledge in the world. The word bound is the word dio, and it has the idea of forbidding. What he's, for, he's forbidden from doing something for Kilia, C-H-I-L-I-A, Kilia. And that's not the word thousand. It's actually the word 2,000. For the last 2,000 years, and I'll go into it later, for the last 2,000 years, Satan is forbidden from doing something. Verse 3, and he was cast into the bottomless pit, the place of no knowledge, the peoples of the world, and shut him up and set a seal on him. He was put in the bottomless pit to do the following, that he should deceive the nations no more. The word nation is ethnos, E-T-H-N-O-S, and that means non-Jews. We get the word ethnic, and that means non-Jews... There is a period of time where he will be locked into the place of, into the abusos, the bottomless pit, a place of no knowledge. That's the world that doesn't have any knowledge. And he will be forbidden from deceiving the non-Jews or the Gentile elect. That's what he's going to be forbidden from deceiving. Now, when you've got the scorpions, the false teachers coming out of the bottomless pit, and you've got the beast coming out of the bottomless pit to attack the two witnesses in Revelation 11, and, that, and the, two, the, the two witnesses is not Moses and Elijah, or Moses and Enoch, or Enoch and Elijah, it's the two olive trees, the two anointed ones, and the two that were anointed in the Old Testament was the priest and the king, and that's us. When the world beast system comes out of the place of no knowledge, it will attack the church. That's allegorical language. I hope I haven't lost, lost you too far. But it's one picture. You can't see it without seeing the whole thing. That's why you have to isolate bottomless pit and show what it means. Isolate scorpions. Pull them all out of the different places. Isolate these things. Set them. It's, when you teach math, you set up the rule here and the rule here and the rule over here and separate them and everything that applies to this rule, everything that applies to this rule, everything that applies to this rule, then you can work the equation. Anybody, I heard... I have a tender heart for John MacArthur, but... He said something ignorant one time about Revelation. I heard him on the radio, and he said, he read verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for the times at hand. He said, see, blessed are they that readeth. It ain't so tough. Oh, yes, it is. You've got to do a lot of studying to see the allegorical picture. It is tough. But once you start getting an understanding what scorpions are, what angels are, what seven is, you can start seeing the, the painting of the picture, and you actually have to go off into other sections of the Scripture. I'm going to have to stop. I'm going to stay on Revelation for a while and get kind of... This is probably the most exhaustive teaching I've ever done on it. And it's in the form of the number seven because you got it all the way through the book. The false teachers are here. The sword, famine, and pestilence, and beast in the sixth chapter, that's a panoramic view of all time. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, sword, famine, pestilence, beast, how long they've been riding? <laughs> they've been riding since the Garden of Eden. It's not some spooky thing when you see, you see a cover of a book and, and, you, and the pale horse has got, a, got this hood over him. He's got a skeleton, his skeleton hand sticking out. You got one evil maybe looking man, he's got a sword and one riding a horse, he's got a bow and they got this evil war look.
that discourages me. We got idiots that like to paint pictures like that. Because all that does is mislead people into thinking it's some future event when, now I'm not saying that nuclear warheads are not going to be exploding. Blessed is he that readeth and understands. You mean you can't understand this book till the end of time till we got nuclear warheads? Is that what you're trying to say? No, they could understand this back then. In fact, in the first century, they could understand this better than we can, can right now because they knew all the terminology. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth. Help me to keep unraveling this picture because you're a magnificent God that you can paint it with words, with this political cartoon wording that men have a hard time seeing if they're not believers. You said we're blessed when we can read this, and that's why you speak to us in parables, because it's given to us to know, and it's not given to these vessels of wrath to see. Thank you for truth. Give me strength and courage. Lord, I've got a lot of health problems. I pray if it's according to your mercy, you'll let me stay for a long time to teach the sheep, Lord. I feel it's so imperative to teach this word. Help us to see and understand truth. Continue to open the mysteries of this book to me and to those that are here. Crush us under your hand. And Lord, fight our battles. In Christ's name, amen.